Hi. Um, so I thought I'd do a video today about infrared photography. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, infrared is the part of the light spectrum um, that kind of extends past the red end of visible light. Um, so you imagine a rainbow, you've got kind of blue at one end and, and red at the other end. Infrared light is the part that stretches past that. You might be thinking, why bother? Um, basically, the images that you can produce um, if you shoot the right subject matter can look fairly impressive. They can, you know, they, they have a sort of certain something about them that's different to a normal visible light photograph and it's, it's sort of quite fun to experiment with. Um, so you're probably wondering how to go about doing it. The main problem you're going to hit is that most cameras come with a filter in front of the sensor inside the camera that blocks infrared light. The reason being that that focuses differently to visible light. Um, so if the camera was sensitive to it, um, you'd end up with kind of soft images, weird colour effects, this kind of problem. Um, so yeah, out of the box, your camera won't really record infrared light. Um, you can buy some cameras that are um, modified for astrophotography. Um, they often have a sort of A as the suffix on the end of the model number. Um, and these ones will be sensitive to infrared light as well as visible light. They're often what we call full spectrum cameras. Um, now, if you've got a camera that's currently got the infrared blocking filter on it, you have the option, of course, of getting that removed. And you can send your camera away and they will remove the filter off the, uh, off the sensor. Um, the next thing you need, um, which probably makes a little bit of weird sense to begin with, is that you need a filter to then only allow infrared light through and to block visible light. Um, for the reason I mentioned earlier, um, you don't want to really be imaging visible light and infrared light at the same time. So uh, what you can do is you can either, when you get your camera converted, have the uh, infrared allowing filter fitted over the sensor instead, or the path I've gone down is to get um, a filter that you screw on the front of a lens, same as you would with a polarizer, an ND filter, that kind of thing. And um, here's the one I'm using. Uh, and you'll see it's pretty black. You can't see through it. Um, so it's, it's sort of similar to using, I guess, a, a sort of big stopper type filter. Um, however, because the camera is sensitive to infrared light once the filter's been removed, um, it can see through this quite well. So I'll just pop this onto the uh, lens here. And if I turn this this way around, you'll see my ugly mug there um, in red. So although we can't see through that with visible light, the camera, when it's sensitive to infrared light, can see through it. Um, now you might be wondering, well, can I just get one of those filters and stick it on the front of my camera um, without having to bother converting the camera? Uh, you can, um, but because it's so dark, you're going to run into the same problem as you will do with ND filters in that your exposure times are going to be very, very long. So if you just stick an infrared filter on the front of a normal camera, um, you're going to need a tripod. Your exposure times are going to be sort of 30 seconds upwards. Um, I did experiment with this a couple of years ago um, and didn't really have much success because even with the long exposures, um, the camera just, you know, it's it's not sensitive to the light frequencies that you really want to be recording. Um, so ideally a converted camera, that's actually my old camera. Um, so I, I sort of upgraded last year and this one was sitting on a shelf doing nothing, which is why I decided I might as well give it a try. Um, what else? What to shoot? Um, so not everything works well as an infrared photo. Um, I guess the ideal day for the traditional infrared shot would be a summer day, lots of foliage on the trees um, and little white fluffy clouds in the sky. Um, reason for that is that um, foliage tends to shine quite brightly in infrared light um, and the blue sky and water, those kind of things, tend to come out very dark, very black, um, whereas the clouds are still quite white. So you can get a very um, dramatic sort of contrasty monochrome picture in those light conditions. 
Um, but to be honest, you can try shooting anything in infrared um, and see what comes out, really. Um, it doesn't have to end up as a black and white image. You can also um, play around with the colours as well. Um, so that's what we're going to do now, is we'll jump over into Lightroom um, and take an infrared shot that I produced a while ago, um, and we'll look at how we go about processing that. Um, there's a sort of extra step you need to do the first time. Um, you subsequently don't need to. Um, so we'll look at how you uh, how you do that as well. So let's head on over into Lightroom and um, take a look at the image. Okay, so here we are in Lightroom. Um, and here's an example picture, um, which I took a while ago with the filter I just showed you over the lens. Um, and obviously on first impressions, it's kind of a bit weird looking. It's very, very red. Um, and that's because, you know, we're picking up very red spectrum light, I guess. Um, with infrared photography, it's, it's kind of good to try and pick the right subject matter um, for the photo. Um, and generally, you'll see a lot of images in infrared where um, the, the sort of subject matter is foliage, because you'll see uh, in this example, the grass in the field over here and the trees um, show up quite white. And that's not their natural colour, it's just they sort of reflect um, the sunlight in such a way as to be quite bright in the infrared part of the spectrum. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that uh, sky and water are relatively dark. Um, so an ideal day for taking an infrared photo would be sort of in the middle of the summer, um, a sunny day but with little white fluffy clouds in the sky and lots of trees. Uh, it's been the winter here, in fact if, although it's the middle of April, um, it still feels like winter to be honest. Um, so these trees are actually bare with no leaves on them and things, but they still, it's enough to show us the, the effect. Um, so we obviously want to get rid of the, uh, the sort of red colour cast um, and try and uh, generally get the foliage to sort of be nice and bright white. So what we'd normally do is adjust our white balance down. Um, but we end up with it, we, we sort of can't go far enough. We get purple and we can turn this down and we can start getting it sort of towards white. But it's sometimes nice to have a further range of adjustment here. So let's just reset this to how we imported it. Um, and what we need to do is create a custom camera profile. And you only need to do this once and it'll then be available to, uh, to choose from. Uh, and to do that, we have to use um, a different tool. We use this free download, which is the uh, Adobe DNG profile editor. And we can use this to create a custom camera profile. The reason we use this is that uh, it offers a much wider range of, of white balance, which Lightroom will then pick up. So we're effectively uh, using this to allow us to have the white balance in Lightroom give us much more control. So because of the name of that tool, uh, DNG Profile Editor, we need a DNG file to begin with. And this is still a raw file from the camera. So we want to go and export our image out to be a DNG. And we just pick that as the file type on the drop down, leave everything else kind of as it is, and export. Now we can go into here and open that up. There we go. Um, and generally, uh, the way I tend to use this is just basically to crank down the white balance adjustment here until we get it as far as it'll go. And we can play with this a little bit more. Um, but generally, you shouldn't need to do much more than simply set that to minus 100. And we can then basically save our profile. So I've done this a couple of times before. Um, for the purposes of this demo, I will give it a new name. Um, so let's call it IR Demo. And that was exported. And I believe we do need to just go and close Lightroom and then reopen it again. Okay, so here we are back in Lightroom, and the profile we just created should now be available. Um, so I'm on the latest version here, so uh, this is the sort of new way that they've arranged profiles up at the top of the uh, develop module here. Previously, they were tucked away down the bottom, impossible to find. And if we go to uh, 
scroll down the list here, we need to find the one that we just created, wherever it is hiding. Ah, there we go, on our demo. Okay, so let's apply that. And you'll see this has already uh, pinged us right up to the top of the available white balance. Um, and we have an enormous range of adjustments. We can now go down and make it horrendously blue. So let's uh, pick on the eyedropper tool and sample what we would like to sort of be white in our image, um, which is generally going to be foliage. So we could click on the grass there or maybe this tree over here. And you'll see this um, has now got rid of the sort of orange colour cast that we had before. Um, and we have this rather lovely ethereal sort of effect here. Um, so we want to do a little bit more to this image. Um, and there's various options. We can go for a black and white conversion. Um, and that's what a lot of people do. Um, a lot of people also do uh, what we call a colour swap. And this is to get this sort of slightly muddy looking sky back to blue, but while keeping the sort of interesting white effect we have on the foliage here. Um, so I think we can maybe give that a whirl on this image. But before we do that, um, we just need to do a couple of other steps. If we zoom in, um, it's a little bit soft, this. Um, and there's also some chromatic aberration going on. So we can go down to our lens corrections. Um, just tick that. That should clear that up a little bit, gets rid of those uh, color fringes. Um, the other thing we can do is make sure that we've got a decent range of brightness tones in the image. So again, if we come in here, um, we can adjust our white up. Um, a trick I've shown you before, I think, is to hold down the Alt key while adjusting this. Um, and you'll see when it sort of creeps into being blown out. So we just want to make sure we're not at that point. And then we can do the same for the blacks. Drop those down. And again, once we get a few speckles, we can stop. So that gives us um, a more contrasty image. So uh, let's take that over into Photoshop. And I'll show you how I do the, uh, the color swap method. It's relatively straightforward. Okay, here we are in Photoshop. Um, and to get our sky to go blue, um, we basically go to Image Adjustments and then the Channel Mixer. Um, the Channel Mixer is basically uh, taking the input red, green and blue channels in the image um, and lets us alter those. So the defaults kind of make sense. The red channel is 100% red. The green channel is 100% green. The blue channel is 100% blue. Um, but we can trick it by switching these. So if we make our red channel not red, and instead make it blue, and then if we go to the blue channel and make it red and not blue, and OK that, um, you'll see the sky has now gone blue, but we've kept the white effect uh, on the foliage here. It sort of goes a little bit pinky coloured as well, but we can uh, we can tweak the colours on this later. Um, the other thing it's probably worth doing is zooming in um, because we've got some little birds flying around and stuff, but they're not big enough to be interesting. They're a bit off-putting. So if we use the spot feeling brush, let's make it a little bit bigger, and we can just uh, get rid of these because they are they look like muck on the picture rather than pretty little birds. Big there. Um, and again, although Lightroom has a spot removal tool, um, I do find this brush in Photoshop tends to do a much better job with the content aware feature that they have. Um, so I think that's okay for that. Let's uh, drop back out into Lightroom again. So if we compare the previous shot, um, you'll see that we now have a nice blue sky. But it has got a slightly sort of teal, greeny colour, um, and we want to make it, I would say, properly blue. So if we go to the colour panel, um, and I think it's probably going to be aqua that we need to adjust, we can push this towards the blue end of things. 
and that gives us a slightly more natural looking uh, effect. Uh, I don't think it needs a boost in saturation. We can do a bit. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, and then if we go back to the basic panel, let's just add a little bit of clarity as well, just to make things pop slightly more. Um, lastly, uh, I think the bottom of the footpath here was kind of in uh, in shade when I took the image so we can brighten that up a little bit as well um, and let's just do that by dropping in a fairly wide grad filter on an angle there we don't need all that clarity on that um, but instead let's just bring up the shadows just to even out the exposure there done um, and there we go, that's a quick look at uh, setting up Lightroom for processing infrared images to get um, some pretty nice effects. Um, we could convert this to mono as well, I won't bother doing that in this tutorial because I think uh, for this particular image I quite like the blue sky effect. Like I say, you only need to do the profile thingy once um, and once you've got it in there you can use that um, for all your pictures. One thing I didn't mention is the infrared filter that you stick over the lens. Um, you can buy those in various different frequencies. Um, uh, they're sort of sold in uh, a nanometer figure as the as the frequency of light. The one I tend to use is a 720 nanometers and that still lets through some color um, or some visible light I guess and that's how we get this sort of effect. You can also buy um, higher frequency filters, so like an 850 nanometer is the next common one that people will tend to use. Um, that's probably more suitable for if you're going to be shooting in black and white um, or producing a black and white end result, I guess. Um, the 720 is probably a good one for at least getting started with um, and, and sort of experimenting with this process. So I hope you found this kind of useful. Um, if you did, feel free to subscribe, give the video a like, and uh, drop in a comment if you've got any questions. I'll try and uh, try and help out. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.